This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org to discover more shows like this one. The darkness awaits. This is a podcast on the Podfix Network. You can check out more shows like it at podfixnetwork.com. While most people who celebrate Thanksgiving are up early brining their turkey, starting their mise en place for stuffing, or filling, because different people in Pennsylvania call that carb-loaded side dish different names, and settling in to watch one or more Thanksgiving Day parades, there are some twisted fucks who are up early on Turkey Day with something more nefarious on their minds. Murder. This is a tale of two Thanksgiving terrors. We have not one, but two true crime tales with ties to Pennsylvania. Actually, there are more than two, but I'm only going to cover two today. So while you're up pulling the neck and gizzards out from inside the cavity of your bird, or sitting back with a coffee or cocktail in another part of the world, wondering why we here in America celebrate our first Thanksgiving with this nation's indigenous persons from whom we actually stole this country, I've got an episode full of murder and mayhem on deck. I'm Dina Marie, your host on this twisted journey. Welcome to the Twisted Philly podcast. There's more mischief, mayhem, and nefarious goings on in the city of brotherly love than Billy Penn could have ever imagined. We've got it all here on the Twisted Philly podcast. True crime, haunted history, the coolest and creepiest places to visit. Welcome Welcome to to Twisted Twisted Philly. Philly. Let's talk about Wawa. In my town, there used to be three Wawas. Now there's just two. Over a year or so ago, the township approved one of the new Super Wawas with gas pumps, multiple entrances, and restrooms. We're a little obsessed with Wawa out here on the East Coast, especially in Philly. I no longer drink coffee, but when I did, it was Wawa coffee. Now I grab chamomile tea on my morning Wawa runs. Calling Wawa a convenience store is an insult. It's like a tiny corner family market. Because after a while, you get to know the Wawa team. You recognize faces. You know who works each shift. When this super Wawa opened on a very busy road in my town, I was miserable because I knew eventually it meant the end of the tiny little Wawa nestled on a tertiary road just a few traffic lights away. Trust me, that tiny Wawa never lacked for business, even after the Super Wawa opened. But we knew eventually it would close. Does one town really need three Wawas within two miles of each other? I say, fuck yeah. The township said differently. Wawa's the sort of place you hit early Thanksgiving morning when you realize you forgot milk or you need that delicious Wawa coffee to get you moving because you're up cooking at 4 a.m. Same thing on Christmas. Wawa never closes. They have shorter hours on holidays, but it's always there for you. Before work, before dinner when your kid says, can you bring home Wawa mac and cheese? In the middle of the night when you're jonesing for one snack or another. And holidays when all the food in your fridge is earmarked for the holiday dinner. And there's really nothing to eat because you haven't started cooking yet. The mornings I've run out to Wawa on Thanksgiving and Christmas to grab my tea, grab a hot chocolate and a donut for my daughter, it's usually 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. I am so grateful for the folks who work at Wawa on holidays, away from their family, so I can pick up whatever last-minute item I forgot but desperately need. Okay, why all this talk about Wawa? That's where 21-year-old Ryan Kelly from the Port Richmond section of Philadelphia headed early Thanksgiving morning in 2015. Ryan was a culinary student who worked at his local Acme grocery store. He lived with his parents and was well-known around his neighborhood as a kind, friendly kid who always had a smile on his face. Pictures of Ryan make me think of an elf. Not because he was short or anything like that, he just has this impish grin that turns up a tiny little bit at the corner of his mouth, a nose and cheeks that are dotted with freckles. His hair is cut short in a few of the pictures I've seen of Ryan, but in others it's longer, and you can see the hint of a curl in his hair sticking out from under a cap. On Thursday morning, November 26, 2015, Ryan Kelly was hungry. 
It was before 5 a.m., Thanksgiving morning. Ryan wanted a snack. It would be hours before he'd be sitting down to Thanksgiving dinner. It wasn't even time for breakfast yet. So Ryan headed out the door to the Wawa down the street from his Port Richmond home that he shared with his parents. Ryan's mother didn't want him to go. Their neighborhood Wawa was only a block or two away, but she worried about Ryan walking alone in the dark morning hours. I can almost hear their conversation. I can imagine Ryan saying, Ma, I'm fine. I'll be back in a few minutes. Ryan Kelly was a good son. He was a good kid. He shoveled snow and did odd jobs for elderly neighbors. And like a good son, he called his mom on the way home from Wawa that Thanksgiving morning. Ryan was on the phone with his mother, less than a block from home, when two men in a white Mazda pulled up and tried to rob him. Ryan Kelly wasn't having it. He wasn't in the mood to get jacked, and he fought off his attackers while he was on the phone with his mother. Ryan's mother stood outside their home on Almond Street and saw someone shoot her son less than a block away. Neighbors heard gunshots and called the police, but they had no idea it was their neighbor, Ryan Kelly, who'd been shot. Police and rescue personnel took Ryan to Temple University Hospital, but it was too late. By 5.30 a.m. on Thanksgiving morning, Ryan Kelly was dead from a single gunshot wound to the chest. How do you reconcile that? Your child walks to a local mini market and minutes later he's dead. Worst of all, you practically see it happen. Police had a description of Ryan's attackers and their car. The car matched the description of a white Mazda stolen around 1 a.m. that morning. And the suspect descriptions were pretty close to those of other robberies that same morning. Most of us don't think of committing crimes on a holiday. Fuck, most of us don't think about committing crimes at all. But the holidays are a peak time for criminals. Think about local malls. The largest mall in the country is right here where I live. And the signs that go up, blog posts, people sharing stories all over social media, they're all about parking in a well-lit area, making sure you have your keys in your hand before you get to your car, don't leave anything in the back seat, don't park and walk alone, make sure you have someone with you walking to and from your car. Crime around the holidays is such a big deal. The Oxygen Network, which recently went true crime all the time, has a new series launching on Saturday, November 25th, just two days after Thanksgiving, called Homicide for the Holidays. Dr. Janet Lauritsen, curator's distinguished professor of criminology and criminal justice at the University of Missouri in St. Louis, researched crime patterns. In a report she co-authored for the Department of Justice, Dr. Lauritsen documented two types of crimes that increase around December, robbery and personal larceny. So while it seems like crime in general is on the rise around the holidays, it's really just those two particular types of incidents. Robbery and larceny spike in December because of what Dr. Lauritsen says is an increased opportunity. There are more people out and about, they're holiday shopping, visiting friends and family, so it's easier for criminals to target potential victims because there's just more people out. That's what 18-year-old David Ramos Jr. and 22-year-old Keenan Glenn were counting on when they went out in Northeast Philadelphia on Thanksgiving morning in 2015. Their first stop was in the Wissanoming section of Philly. That's right next door to Taconi, where Dolores Della Pena lived 45 years ago. Ramos and Glenn found a white Mazda 626 with the key fob left inside. That sounds like opportunity to me. The Wednesday night before Thanksgiving is usually one of the biggest party nights all year long. I think it's even worse than New Year's Eve because you've got so many kids home from college on break. It's often a night for high school reunions. Lots of people are out partying, drinking, forgetting they left their keys in their car. Ramos and Glenn stole that Mazda, then drove through Northeast Philly neighborhoods looking for things to steal. Their next stop was a car parked on Rawl Street in Taconi. Remember that street? That's Dolores de la Pena Street, for Christ's sake. It's crazy how so many of these stories in Philly intersect decades later. They found a wallet left in a parked car. They broke the window and stole it. They headed a little farther north, up to Mayfair, and robbed a woman at gunpoint. 
None of that was enough, though. They were out for hours without getting caught and headed to Port Richmond, where Ryan Kelly refused to hand over his wallet. Ryan talked on the phone with his mother, Catherine Kelly. He said, I'm almost home, Mom, when Ramos and Glenn pulled up alongside Ryan Kelly, tried to rob him, then Ramos shot him in the chest before they sped off. Catherine saw them get in the stolen Mazda and drive away. As devastating as all of that must have been, it gave police something to go on. Descriptions of the suspect and their vehicle. Other news at this hour, Philadelphia police tonight released surveillance pictures that they desperately hope will lead them to a pair of killers. Police say the suspects are armed and dangerous. Authorities want the public's help and they want our viewers to take a close look at these surveillance images. The following week, police released surveillance footage of who they believed were Ryan Kelly's murderers. The photos were of two young men. One was a tall, slender, African-American man wearing a tan coat and pants with a gray hoodie under his coat and a black knit cap. The other young man appeared to be Hispanic. He was shorter than his partner, with short black hair cropped very close to his head. He wore a short, puffy coat with a hood, like a North Face jacket and dark pants. Police want these two men for the Thanksgiving murder of Ryan Kelly, a young man who always had a smile, worked hard at this Northern Liberties Acme, and liked his lunch slice from George's Pizza across the street. The surveillance photos were from a vestibule inside a TD bank. These dumb motherfuckers tried to use the debit card from the wallet they stole from the car off Rawl Street. Maybe they thought they could magically guess the PIN number with the powers of their mind? About a week and a half after Ryan Kelly's murder, police found the stolen Mazda that Ramos and Glenn used in their Thanksgiving crime spree, but they still hadn't identified or arrested the suspects. Philadelphia was on high alert. These men were considered armed and dangerous. They could have been anywhere in the city. And while Ryan Kelly's parents should have been celebrating the joys of the season and Ryan's accomplishments as a culinary student, they instead planned his funeral and held vigils in his name. David Ramos Jr. and Keenan Glenn were in hiding, but they weren't very good at it because Philadelphia police made short work of finding and arresting both suspects. Ramos was arrested on Saturday, January 16th in 2016 in a residence on Frankfurt Avenue in Northeast Philadelphia, not far from where Ryan Kelly was murdered. The arrest comes just hours after a vigil Friday night to remember Kelly. While his father is pleased one suspect has been caught, he says he won't rest until police put the other behind bars. Glenn was arrested in his home in Middletown, Delaware about a week later. Both suspects were charged with the murder of Ryan Kelly, multiple robbery charges, and other offenses related to the crimes they committed on Thanksgiving morning 2015. There was no motive given, other than the feeling they could get away with whatever they wanted. They were young, they probably thought they were invincible, they thought a young man's life didn't matter. Ryan Kelly could have been the next Michael Vincent Ferrari, or Crystal Bryant, they're two of Philadelphia's top chefs. Or he could have been a manager at the Acme where he worked. He could have been happy. And in a split second, these two punks snuffed out his life on his way home from Wawa. In May 2017, Keenan Glenn pled guilty to third-degree murder, robbery, conspiracy, and gun charges in the death of Ryan Kelly. No, he wasn't convicted of first-degree murder. When someone pleads guilty in a murder case, and you see the degrees change, you know there was a plea deal involved. Philadelphia's assistant district attorney, Bridget Kern, didn't disclose the terms of the plea deal. But she did tell the media Keenan Glenn received a 20- to 40-year sentence, provided he follow through with the terms of the agreement. It's possible that agreement includes testifying against David Ramos, whose trial is set for April 2018. I'll be sure to let you know what happens as a result of that trial. Maybe Ramos will develop a conscience and plead guilty, sparing Ryan Kelly's family and friends the hardship of enduring a trial. Depending on when you listen to this episode, I may be about to put my turkey in the oven. I've probably been up since long before dawn baking pies so I don't tie up the oven later. You may be sitting down to dinner with family or friends, or maybe you're in another country laughing over the big deal we make about cooking a full turkey once a year. Whatever I'm doing, I'm also thinking of the Kelly family. My father passed away just about two weeks before Thanksgiving, 19 years ago. He wasn't murdered. 
He was young, only 49, but that's still a lot more living than Ryan Kelly's 21 years. He passed quietly and unexpectedly in his sleep. None of us had to see him get murdered, like Catherine Kelly did with Ryan. The holidays are still a tough time for us. I can't even imagine what this time of year must be like for the Kellys. So I have a favor to ask. I'd love it if you could offer up a prayer during your mealtime grace for Ryan Kelly and his family. Or if you're not the praying sort, which is perfectly okay in my book, you could send out a kind thought for Ryan's family. I believe in the collective power of positive thinking. And maybe if all of us share a thought or a prayer for the Kelly family this Thanksgiving, well, maybe it will give them just one moment of peace. Before we move on to the second chapter in today's episode, I'd like to take a short break, spin some podcast promos for shows that I really enjoy and hope you'll check out, tell you a little bit about the Potter and Love podcast convention next summer, and also share with you an amazing offer for Twisted Philly listeners from the lineup. I'll be back in just a minute or two. You might have heard me mention before, I am a huge fan of subscription boxes. I love the idea of exclusive merchandise that's been selected just for people like me. Sci-fi nerds, Star Wars fans, you name it. Well, our friends at the lineup noticed what they call a lack of disturbing box subscription options, and I have to agree with them. As a horror fan, the idea of a subscription box with creepy, bizarre items sounds like heaven to me. With that in mind, The Lineup, which is a website that curates some of the creepiest, scariest, and most disturbing content on the internet, launched something called Creepy Crate. The team at The Lineup scoured the internet for the coolest, creepiest, most twisted goodies to delight and devil the most serious fans. Here's what Creepy Crate subscription service is. It's $29.99 per crate. Now, they release a new box every other month, so if you subscribe, you get six crates a year. The last day to order a crate for the month is the 8th, because crates ship on the 15th. Each crate's retail value, though, is $55 or more. They produce limited edition exclusive items for Creepy Crate, like T-shirts, true crime travel mugs, enamel pins, and so much more. The team at the lineup sent me a crate to check out, so I'm telling you all of this from personal experience. Creepy Crate is so freaking cool. Crate number four, which was their Halloween box, and that's the one they sent me, had buttons, a custom tee, ebook downloads, comics, and a mystery that you have to solve. Plus, it was actually valued at $85. Each crate always contains at least one ebook download for a true crime or horror book. Here's the best part. The lineup is offering a special promotion for Twisted Philly listeners. If you use promo code Twisted Philly, you'll get $5 off your Creepy Crate subscription. Just go to creepycrate.store for more information and to subscribe. Trust me, I subscribed immediately after opening my crate, and I'm going to share a video of me unpacking all of the creepy loot inside. Again, you want to go to the website creepycrate.store and use code Twisted Philly for $5 off your subscription. In the shadowed recesses of our world, monsters lurk. Despite our reluctance to find them, an unlucky few cross paths. It's these experiences that we explore at Monsters Among Us podcast. My name is Derek Hayes. Each week, I explore calls from around the world detailing chilling encounters with mystery beasts, ghosts, UFOs, and a plethora of other strange happenings. You can find Monsters Among Us podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and most other podcatchers. Hi, I'm Kim. And I'm Felicia. And we're from the Harry Potter Revisited podcast. Each episode is based on the next chapter in the series. We make inappropriate jokes and crass comments along the way. Check out Harry Potter Revisited on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast app. Bye, Felicia. Christmas is right around the corner. I don't know about you, but what I love to do for the people in my life is to treat them to experiences, like tickets to a concert or to a convention. Speaking of conventions, the Potter Love Podcast Convention 
developed by listeners for listeners, which is the first convention of its kind, takes place next August in New Orleans, Louisiana. The Pod and Love convention will feature so many different types of podcasts, including history, paranormal, comedy, entertainment and pop culture, health and fitness, of course, true crime too. If you attend Potter and Love, you'll get a chance to interact with some of your favorite podcast hosts by attending live shows, Q&A sessions, workshops, as well as Podcast Alley with exclusive hours where you can interact one-on-one with some of your favorite hosts. The Potter and Love convention is August 10th, 11th, and 12th, 2018 in New Orleans, Louisiana. All you need to do to find out more information, including how to purchase tickets, who the participating podcasts are, and how to book your reservations at the Intercontinental Hotel where we're hosting the convention, is go to the website at www.potern.love. And if you use code TWISTED, you'll get 10% off your ticket sales. Potern Love convention tickets make a phenomenal gift for the podcast lover in your life, including yourself. I hope to see you all next year in New Orleans. No good deed goes unpunished. I've said that phrase probably hundreds of times in my life, and I'm sure you have too. You know that feeling when you're trying to do the right thing or you're looking out for someone else and a blowback of shit flies in your face. That's what author and politician Claire Booth Luce thought when she coined the phrase. I may not be a conservative like Ms. Booth Luce was, yet I absolutely subscribe to her theory. And that's exactly what happened to the victim in our next tale. Herbert Tracy White received a phone call early Thursday morning, November 28, 2010, Thanksgiving Day. Herbert and his wife, Annie, were in bed. Annie was used to Herbert getting calls in the middle of the night. He was an AA sponsor and a recovered addict and alcoholic who'd celebrated 15 years of sobriety. As a sponsor, Herbert White often received calls at odd hours from people he sponsored, or people he met who weren't in the program but needed help. Drug addicts, alcoholics. Herbert was a kind, considerate man who wanted to give back to people who struggled with addiction, as he did years before. Herbert White lived in Los Angeles. Now I know what you're thinking. This is Twisted Philly. What am I doing telling a story from California? Well, this story has a significant connection to Pennsylvania. That early morning call Herbert White received on Thanksgiving was from Melissa and Edward Garcia, residents of York, Pennsylvania, who'd recently moved across the country to L.A. York, Pennsylvania is about two hours southwest of Philadelphia, not far from the Pennsylvania-Maryland border. Melissa was 25 years old when she and her husband, 30-year-old Edward Garcia, moved to California. Melissa grew up in York, which isn't all Amish buggies and dairy farms. In 2016, as many as 20 gangs were actively racketeering in York. York is a small community with little more than 40,000 residents. The gang activity there is so significant, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms works closely with the York Police Department on federal indictments of gang members. And the indictment against alleged members lays out nothing short of a neighborhood in chaos overrun with crime. Scared. <laughs> I didn't know that was going on here. Some in York had no idea the extent of gang activity. York City Police Chief Wes Cayley says most of the crime in this city is related to gangs. It's so prevalent that gang membership in York is multi generational. Fathers, grandfathers, sons, cousins. Sometimes they're in the same gangs, and then sometimes families cross multiple gangs and are warring with one another. Last year, 15 members of the Latin Kings in York were sentenced to 15 years in prison for trying to traffic heroin into the city. The indictment says just in the Southside Gang, which has ties to the New York Bloods, there are 100 members. It lists 15 examples of violent encounters with rival York Gang Parkway. Innocent bystanders have been caught in crossfire. The indictment also outlines 62 incidents involving members in arrests for guns or drugs. The ATF and York Police say the sweep got the most violent members, but still, the scripted breakdown adds worry for some when it's all laid out right on York streets. 
Edward Garcia didn't grow up in York, Pennsylvania, though. He hadn't been there very long at all when he met Melissa Turner. Garcia was born in Puerto Rico. He and his mother moved to New York when he was very young. They lived together in the Bronx, and a few years after their move to the States, Edward Garcia's mother contracted AIDS. She died as a result of the disease. With no family in New York, the only place for Edward was foster care and group homes. When he was a teenager, he ran away and tried taking care of himself living on the streets of New York. That's how he landed in the Latin Kings. The gang basically adopted him. They became his family. They taught him how to live on the streets and how to make money, which meant hustle and sell drugs. But they also provided a cultural connection to his mother and his Puerto Rican roots that he'd long missed since his mother passed away. By the time Edward Garcia was 30, he'd been in the gang close to half his life, and he wanted out. The only way for him to do that, though, was to leave New York. So Edward Garcia moved to York, Pennsylvania to live with friends. But his time outside the gang lifestyle was short-lived, partly because it's the only way he knew how to survive, and partly because of York's prevalent gang culture. Garcia met Melissa Turner at a party in York when she was just 25. Melissa was born and raised in York, and she suffered a difficult and disturbing childhood. She was sexually assaulted as a young child. She developed depression in her teens and self-destructive behavior. By the time Melissa was 20, she was addicted to heroin and crack, which is easy to get because York has a horrible drug problem, fueled primarily by the gangs. Turner and Garcia bonded almost instantly. They both suffered loneliness and depression. They were both fascinated with the occult, but for different reasons. Edward practiced Santeria to make him feel connected to his mother, but he took his beliefs down a much darker path than traditional practitioners of Santeria. Melissa's depression and self-harming created an obsession with death. Their other common interest was drugs, especially heroin. Their obsessive tendencies didn't stop with the drugs. The relationship was one great, big, twisted, dark, sexual obsession. Just two weeks after meeting, Melissa Turner became Melissa Garcia. Edward liked it so much, he put a ring on it, and they were married. In February 2009, over a year before they wound up in Los Angeles, Melissa and Edward Garcia were charged with kidnapping and robbery. Melissa pretended to be a sex worker. She met a man at a local bar and invited him back to their house. His name was Charlton Anderson, and he thought he was in for a night of sex with an attractive young woman, although he'd have to pay for it. What he got instead was jumped by Melissa's husband, Edward Garcia. Once inside the house, Charlton disrobed, and Edward jumped out of a closet with a knife. The Garcias bound his hands and feet. They stole his money and used it to go on a crack bender. A friend of Charlton Anderson's called his cell phone while he was tied up at the Garcia's. Edward Garcia answered the phone and told the man, come on over. His plan was to entice the second man with the proposition of sex with Melissa, then tie him up and rob him as well, like they did with Charlton Anderson. That isn't what happened, though. When he arrived, Anderson's friend fought back. He freed Charlton Anderson and reported what happened to the police. Melissa and Edward Garcia were charged with kidnapping. Now, that's no small charge, but they pled to lesser offenses, partly because Charlton Anderson refused to testify against them or to press charges. The Garcias were soon back on the streets of York. Melissa and Edward Garcia supported themselves and their addictions by robbing local dealers. Edward's experience over half his life as a dealer himself and gang member meant he knew the habits and patterns of other dealers. It made them easy targets for Edward and Melissa Garcia until the York scene caught on to them. Between the police keeping an eye on them after the kidnapping in February and local dealers who wanted revenge, the Garcias found themselves in a really bad place. By fall of 2010, they needed to get out of York, Pennsylvania, and they decided to move all the way across the country. Maybe it was the appeal of the palm trees and the California sun, it's certainly easier to live on the streets when you're not dealing with harsh winters like we have out here on the East Coast. On a dark desert highway, cool wind in, my hair. in the fall of 2010, the Garcias found themselves living in sunny California. But life in Hollywood was no easier for them than it was in York. 
Melissa and Edward Garcia lived out of their car for a while. Then it was towed and they moved into a homeless shelter. A few days before Thanksgiving in November 2010, the Garcias met a man named Herbert Tracy White on the streets of Hollywood outside a bank. They noticed him taking money out of an ATM and thought he might be an easy mark. Herbert White talked to them about his work as an addiction sponsor. He told them if they wanted to get clean to give him a call, he could help, and he gave them his business card. So when that call came shortly after midnight on November 28th, Herbert left his wife to the comfort of their bed, and he went to meet Melissa and Edward Garcia. That was the last time Herbert's wife, Annie White, ever saw her husband alive. On Friday, November 29th, 2010, a maid at the Continental Hotel on Skid Row in Hollywood knocked on the door of room 66. When no one answered, she used her master key to open the door and clean the room. The guests in room 66 hadn't yet checked out, so she assumed they were merely out for the day or for a few hours. There was a strange scene in the room. The sheets were gone from the bed. The mattress was stripped bare. Atop the mattress in the center of the bed sat a Lakers cap. Clearly, the guests in room 66 weren't Sicilian because they didn't know the superstition about not putting hats on beds, or shoes on the table for that matter. Next to the bed on the floor sat a backpack. Now normally bags and suitcases wouldn't be inspected by hotel staff. But the maid had a bad feeling about the condition of room 66. And she had good reason, because when she looked inside the bag, she found a pair of human arms bound together with duct tape. They'd been severed from their body. She immediately ran downstairs and told the hotel manager who contacted Los Angeles police. Los Angeles police and crime scene investigators converged on the Continental Hotel. Now, this wasn't a five-star property. Hell, it was barely a one-star property. It's home for the homeless who scrape together enough money to rent a room for one night. The Continental was known for drug addicts and sex workers, transients looking for a place to crash who didn't care about the conditions. But what the police found in room 66 was worse than anyone could have imagined, even for the Continental Hotel. There was a torso under the bed. It was almost completely devoid of blood. The arms were removed. The maid found those in the backpack. The legs were removed. There were tiny puncture marks all over the torso, scratches, gouges, and worse that I'm not going to share. Police also found a three-inch hunting knife, plastic bags with meth residue, and bloody underwear. Not expecting much, the police asked the Continental Hotel manager if he had any information about the guest in room 66. Surprisingly, he did. At about 2 a.m. Thanksgiving morning, a man checked in with a young woman he claimed was his girlfriend. Because the man was unfamiliar to the hotel manager, usually there's regulars going in and out of the Continental Hotel, the manager asked for a copy of his driver's license. The man found butchered in room 66 was 49-year-old Herbert Tracy White. After breaking the news to Herbert's wife, Annie, police learned about the late-night phone call Herbert White received from people needing help. Annie didn't know who had called, so the police questioned other sponsors in Herbert's AA group, and he learned about the young couple Herbert met a few days earlier outside an ATM. They suspected this was the couple seen checking into the Continental with Herbert White on Thanksgiving morning. Melissa and Edward Garcia were captured on surveillance cameras outside the hotel. They were seen fleeing via the fire escape, then walking away from the hotel down 7th Street. Once the police had their images from surveillance footage, they compared the photos to copies of IDs on file at the Continental Hotel, and sure enough, copies of driver's licenses proved it was Melissa and Edward Garcia from York, Pennsylvania. Los Angeles police feared the Garcias fled California to make their way back to Pennsylvania so they cast a wide net of publicity to find them. 
News reports from California to York ran stories about Melissa and Edward Garcia. Their photos ran on America's Most Wanted with John Walsh. For all that publicity, it took a lot less to find the Garcias. A homeless man squatting in an abandoned building on La Brea Avenue in L.A., just about 10 miles away from the Continental Hotel, recognized the pair. They were living in the same building as him, and he called the police. Both Melissa and Edward Garcia were arrested. When he was questioned, Edward Garcia told police he and Melissa called Herbert Tracy White for help, and White offered to get them a hotel room. Edward then claimed White told him he wanted to get high and pulled out two bags of meth. He gave both bags to Edward and Melissa, letting them get high. He didn't do it himself. Their story that Herbert White brought them drugs is just incredibly hard to believe. White was clean for over 15 years. He was so committed to his sobriety and the sobriety of others. He became an AA sponsor. He was a counselor. He worked with addicts in prison because he'd been in prison himself on drug charges before he got clean. Yet all of a sudden, out of the blue, after meeting Edward and Melissa Garcia for just a few minutes the day before Thanksgiving, he suddenly wants to get high with them and throw away everything he's worked for? I don't buy that for a fucking minute. During his interview with police, Edward Garcia said that he and Melissa did both bags of meth and it had a weird effect on them. Edward said he felt as if he was burning up. He took a shower, he passed out, and the next thing he remembered was walking on the street with Melissa. Both of them claimed they didn't remember anything about their time in the hotel room with Herbert Tracy White because of the meth. And that was bullshit. They may not have remembered every minute detail because they were whacked out of their fucking minds, but they were coherent enough to wrap Herbert's arms in duct tape, hide them in a backpack, clean up most of the blood in the room, throw away the sheets, hide the knife, and flee down the fire escape instead of checking out. Eventually, Edward Garcia confessed to murdering Herbert White. <laughs> Melissa and Edward Garcia were charged with first-degree murder. Edward's trial began May 27, 2015, almost five years after Herbert Tracy White was killed. Los Angeles Deputy District Attorney John McKinney told the jury the Garcias killed Herbert White to fulfill a dark fantasy. Their fascination with death and the occult had them dreaming about what it would be like to kill someone. McKinney called the murder a ritual. The Garcias fantasized about dismembering a body and draining its blood. Herbert White was the perfect victim. He felt bad for Melissa and Edward Garcia. He wanted to help them as he'd helped so many addicts and homeless people in Los Angeles. During the trial, more details emerged about the murder. Melissa and Edward Garcia did indeed get high off meth. And once they were high, they thought White was the perfect opportunity to play out their dismemberment fantasies. They bound Herbert White with duct tape and slashed the skin on his chest and his face. Then they cut his throat, which ultimately killed him. The dismemberment didn't occur until after death. Thank God for small favors. Edward Garcia told the jury he felt remorse over what he'd done, but that was no consolation for Herbert's wife, Annie White, or his mother, Elizabeth White Peterson. Both had to endure losing a beloved husband and son and suffer through testimony dealing with how Herbert White was tortured and murdered. You think it wasn't hard? <laughs> it was very, very, very hard. You can imagine about how hard that might have been, yeah. And then, not only for myself, but I'm there trying to control myself and having to try to control both my sons, too, one on this side, one on this side, and, you know, sealing them tense up. And it was not something that I would wish on anybody ever to have to go through. In June 2015, jurors found Edward Garcia guilty of first-degree murder with special circumstances, including murder during a robbery and murder involving torture. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. A few months later, on September 18th, 2015, Melissa Garcia pled guilty to voluntary manslaughter, residential burglary, second-degree robbery, and mayhem. She was sentenced to 16 years in prison. She will be eligible for parole in 2031. 
In my case, I wish she would have went to trial because 16 years, is, to me, is a slap on the wrist. I had my, my downfalls when I was younger, and 16 years is a slap on the wrist. To me, it's a slap to the family, a slap to the family's face because this means that by her being 26, 27, she still be young enough to go out there and probably do the same thing again when she get out. She'd be out in 14 years. That's, that's still a whole lot, whole lot of young youthfulness to go out and decide, okay, let me get another boyfriend, let me set these other guys up. I preferred that she would have, I would have preferred that she would have went to trial. Some would say that's young enough to start over, maybe get married, possibly even have a family. Meanwhile, the White Peterson family will forever grieve the loss of Herbert Tracy White. As I asked earlier for Ryan Kelly and his family, I will ask again for Herbert Tracy White. If you could please spare a thought or a prayer for the White Peterson family for comfort and peace this Thanksgiving, I'd appreciate it. You know, the holidays can be such a wonderful time of year for so many of us, and yet it can also bring real sadness. If you find yourself in a dark or lonely place this time of year or any time, you don't have to shoulder those feelings alone. If you don't have anyone to reach out to locally, you've got a shitload of friends here in the Twisted Philly community. Drop me a note on Facebook or Twitter or post something in the Twisted Philly discussion group. I know any one of us would take the time to listen. Now that we're coming to the end of our time together today, I can't say goodbye until I share a whole bunch of what ups. What up to our five star reviewers on iTunes? Last Laughs and V Mommy by Four. Both recently finished binging Twisted Philly. Anytime someone says they binged my show, my heart gets so full because I know how much I have to love a show to binge listen. Thank you so much. What up to Chip15? Hey, Chip, thanks for listening. What up to K. Kayla J. Jane, another binge listener who is planning a trip to Philly? What up to A. Kearney and Silly in Philly? Both are local listeners. Thank you so much for listening, and I am really glad you feel I'm doing a good job telling stories from our hometowns. What up to Moonwood Christina and to Jenny Penny, who lives in L.A. but gets to visit Philly? Jenny, you mentioned attending a con. I talked about the Potter and Love convention during the break, and I hope you'll consider attending next August. What up to Andy Cohen? That's right, Andy Cohen from Bravo who quoted and retweeted a tweet I shared this week where I actually made fun of his hair. I compared it to a weeping angel or finger waves from the 20s. He was a great sport about it, and both my daughter and I flipped a little that Andy Cohen tweeted with me on Twitter. It's the little things. Oh, before I forget, if you are cooking a turkey, don't forget to take out the disgusting bag with the turkey neck and gizzards that's stuffed deep inside the cavity of the bird before you cook it. Yeah, I am speaking from personal experience. It was a long time ago, but nonetheless. I'd like to thank Emmy Sarah for the music you heard in this and every episode. Emmy, I am eternally grateful to you for sharing your unbelievable talent with me and all of the Twisted Philly listeners. I want to wish a beautiful, happy, and peaceful Thanksgiving to you and your wonderful family. As always, thank you for listening. That's it from me. Ciao for now, Twisters.